This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoc Sears. Hey, Agile Architects, this is Enoc, and welcome back to the business of architecture. Today, I had an exceptional conversation with Mona Quinn, an architect in New Zealand, and she has a problem. Mona has too much work. She spends a lot of her time every day following up with all the project leads that are pouring into her office. In fact, she's raised her fees to try and lower the workload. So today she took time off from following up with the leads that are coming into her office to take us behind the scenes of the successful marketing strategy that booked her firm solid in less than four months. Mona's been very generous to share this information with us, so if you're a solo architect and could use more good paying projects, listen to this interview. It could change your life and your business. Well, thanks everybody. Welcome out to this episode of Business of Architecture. Today we're joined by Mona Quinn. She is the principal of Calidus Architects, which is New Zealand's leading character home architecture firm. And Calidus specializes in renovating character homes in New Zealand. So Mona, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ina. Please tell us a little bit about what your firm does and what is a character home? Um, What's unique about New Zealand is um, that um, most of our older housing stock is built out of wood. I'm sure it's the same in New Zealand, but we are come from originally in Denmark. That's not the case. But um, so, what uh, when New Zealand was colonised, there was a lot of beautiful old homes built um, throughout the whole country, and a lot of um, the building skills and building knowledge of how to continuously upgrade and um, also modernise and renovate those. Um, for today's market, that, that's quite a unique skill and there's a lot of the um, new builders that come out onto market, they don't know how to deal with old properties and how to detail them correctly and restore them correctly, so we saw that as a huge huge um, niche for us to um, again try and go in and, and just try and establish ourselves as specialists in the market because the other problem I find architects try and be um, uh, jack of all trades or not specialized in something and in, in a sense yes you want to do great architecture but you also have to um, run a business and try and make some money to put food on the table and we thought um, I've always been really interested in heritage and I think it has a lot um, to show us and we can still learn a lot from the past and a lot of it has been forgotten um, in today's world of just fast action and quick buck all the time um, so uh, it, we, we want to take the old houses, houses in the old neighbourhoods of New Zealand as a way to start having a conversation or how are we going to do the new neighbourhoods of New Zealand and the new houses of New Zealand to be just as great so that in 120 years you still want to restore those and preserve those because we suffer uh, cruelly from a lot of cookie cutter houses and cookie cutter neighbourhoods. I'm sure it's happening in the States. We see a lot of photos from um, <laughs> neighbourhoods over here as well. Um, but unfortunately, I don't see that as a very sustainable way of managing the Earth's resources and also um, of managing people's happiness. Um, I recently had a case where one of my friends was also an architect. He bought a greenfield site in, an, in a new neighborhood and he built this amazing home, his own design, he was so happy with it. And it's now eight years uh, down the track and he's deeply unhappy with his house because all around him he's got, um, I don't know if you call them cookie cutter houses, but he's got, you know, really fast three months turnaround built houses and he actually thinks it's devalued his property and also devalued the neighborhood because people, there's a high turnover in terms of selling and buying the houses in the area. So um, just trying trying to uh, put some value back in what good design and also to take the time out to um, do subdivisions and do neighborhoods and do houses for the residential market um, better. Yeah. Sure. Is there a difference between the value that is placed on the more traditional housing stock between Denmark and New Zealand? What's the Totally. Um, yes, very much so. The, the housing stock in in Denmark is a lot older um, because we've been around for longer than New Zealand has in terms of being a nation. Um, and what's really interesting about it, as you know, probably well know, Denmark is very well recognized for design and style and quality uh, throughout design, but it also applies with respect to um, housing and how people 
see investing in their properties. So one typical example would be my uh, aunt and uncle, for example. They were they were just putting a little small room extension on their property, not you know a flesh neighbourhood or anything in in Denmark, but they still went to see an architect because of course you go and see an architect if you want to do anything to your house. You know that's the first point of call. So that's so, so you know, they're just bulk standard average people, but they still see that, of course, you have to have an architect. It's not even a question. It's just a given. Whereas, um, I don't know about the States, but let me just go up out there and say, I think it's the same in the States as it is here. That is not what people think when they first want to put just a one room extension onto the house. Um, so, so that whole value of what architects can give to a property and what they can give to um, a neighborhood or an area that is, is somehow lost here and and uh, you know it sounds like a big uh, chunk to take on but I would like to try and see if I could change that and try and ascertain that value back and make people understand what it is we do so uh, one thing we're doing that we're doing lots of different things at the moment but one thing we're doing is actually we're working with a um, franchise whoa shock horror you know they're the horrible people we hate isn't it but um, what actually happens is um, so they specialise in renovations, um, but we do go in and work them. It's a slightly smaller fee because we don't have to spend any time getting the clients, but um, they try to persuade their clients because they can see the value in what we do to, to go and just have a uh, spend some time with me trying to put the concept together, even just for this quite uh, basic stuff. And the positive outcomes we have out of these very sceptical clients normally who would never, you know, they go to the renovation builders, they don't want to go to architects because we're so expensive and terrible people. Um, but the, the responses we've gotten out of them once they do see what we can do them and how we can help the planning and make the money they spend being spent more effectively is uh, a huge joy for us and also obviously for them because um, all, all of a sudden it clicks in their head and they see what what value architects can provide to um, to properties. Yeah. Fascinating. And how much of the process is you educating the client and how much of it are or how many clients come to you already knowing what they want and realizing the value of what you do? Yeah, so the way we try and um, and set up our business is that we want to um, pre, how do you say, uh, vet them before we even talk to them because I've, I actually spend a lot of time talking to people where no work comes out of it and um, we've set up our system so they're basically pre-vetted so before I even go and see them they already know who we are, they've already received all the referrals and the photos and all that sort of stuff. So they've gone through, um, I think it's a six stage process and I already know what their brief is, I already know how much money they want to spend. And um, so when we have our first meeting it's very effective and we can very quickly go and you know it only takes about an hour to actually turn it around and then I'll send it and then the whole free proposal thing is almost a, probably about we have a, a success rate after our initial meeting of about 80% in terms of clients signing on. But it also means that you know, you've gotten rid of the people you didn't actually want to work with before you, sit, before you actually spend the time to go and see them. Exactly. Okay. Well, that is a, you just described there a very complex sales and marketing process. And I'm going to yes. leave that open to sort of hook our listeners here. We're going to come back and circle around to that at the, the later part of the interview. But before we jump into that, Mona, let's take a step back really quickly and just tell us a little bit about your journey to become an architect. I do, you know, yes. Um, yes, it's an interesting role to be in as a woman, I find. Um, but I was pretty much sold on it from the first time I met my first uh, female architect back in high school because the things she had to say and how she was dealing with the built environment and space all around us. I think that um, particularly from a residential market, probably is a bit of great interest to women to seem to spend a lot of time looking at magazines about house decorating but I, I wanted to be one of the ones who actually did the homes as well so I guess that's where my initial interest came and, and also from having growing up in a very old um, part of Denmark where we can trace you know the ancestry back 2,000 years um, wow. just all around in the neighborhood it sort of brings it goes back to the whole thing about heritage for me I guess and the sense of belonging and the sense of being part of, of an area so that was sort of where I decided I would like to become an architect in my um, youth. <laughs> it's a bit wee while ago now. So I tried to get into um, the architecture school in Copenhagen, which is quite hard because it's very uh, popular and there's lots of international students there. I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's connected to the Royal Academy of Fine Arts um, 
the year. So it took two guys, but I finally made it in, so it was great. And while I was um, there, I met my husband, who is from New Zealand, and that was why I sort of ended up in New Zealand in the long run. But what has been of great benefit to me is actually having had the opportunity to study both at the um, Royal Academy in Copenhagen and also when I transferred to New Zealand I did my last year and a half at the New Zealand School of Architecture here in Victoria uh, University in Wellington and I think that was a great benefit um, to me because then it comes from such a strong tradition of design and taste and style so when you are at schools of architecture there the focus is so much on design and style and taste but um, you get cuffed out in the other end, you don't actually know how to run an office. So that can be quite frustrating and, and hard. Uh, whereas when you take the last year of architecture school in New Zealand, they're much more pragmatic in here. Of course, you still got to do good design, but the last year also focused a lot around pragmatic aspects of how to run a practice, and how to just do all the sort of business aspects of it, I guess. So I, find, I find, found it hugely beneficial to um, actually having studied at two different schools and two different ways of thinking. Fascinating. Yeah. So, yeah, so um, what, another thing that happened in between coming from Copenhagen down to New Zealand was I actually worked on a building site for a, um, a year in Jamaica, which was uh, great, <laughs> you know, so dealing with a really big contractor, working for them, dealing with um, slightly unconventional Jamaicans in terms of how you deal with health and safety on site and smoking cannabis, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, that was a great experience for me as well and how, because that's the, that's the other thing that's an interesting aspect of being an architect is you go to all these higher forms of taste when you're at university and um, everyone speaks in this high level plane and then you go out and you talk to the builder, you know, who's like, yeah mate, what are you going to do? Yeah, um, so how you actually negotiate that huge scale and range of, of people that you interact with and deal with. I think that's, you know, it's the conversation that's the biggest challenge for architects, I think, because if you don't get everyone on your boat believing in what you want to do, especially the build it's on site, then it's a lost course in some respect. Okay. So you've mentioned so far two different sort of conversations that you have with people and the power of convincing and persuading them. The first one you mentioned was talking to the client when they come in and you sort of describe the process of renovating and how you go about your practice. Yeah. And you mentioned you have an 80% success rate, partially because of the vetting that you do. And then yes. you also you also just mentioned, Mona, the talking with the builders and being able to relate to them and have that conversation with them. Yeah. How did, what, what have you learned about having, the, I call that a sales conversation, I don't know if that's what you call it, but just the conversation where you're convincing someone and you're bringing them along and, and compromising and building that. What pointers can you give us? What have you learned about having those kind of conversations? Um, if, we, if we just take the builders first, I think um, the first thing I normally do is I go in and I just crack jokes about architects because they think we're so high and mighty and full of ourselves. <laughs> so um, they, uh, they do find that they come very, um, you know, an architect and a woman. It's pretty tough going. Um, so can, wait, so can you give me one though? Can you give me, I need, I need a joke now. Can you give us one? Oh, I'm coming. Oh, oh what, what could I say? Oh, yeah, just architects are such shits at time management, aren't they? Or something like that, you know, yeah, just, there's sure. a problem on site. So then they just see instantly, oh, well, she so can actually crack a joke because New Zealanders, especially in the building industry, it's all about cracking a joke. And if you can crack a joke, you know, um, then you're sort of on their side a bit more because they often see they often see architects very much as being on the client's side, but you have to try and be fair, you know, and impartial to people that you deal with. But just... There's a lot of tension, especially when you start a, a building project, but also when you finish it. So, so in some ways, I almost find well, you're the mediator between the person paying for the job and the person billing the job in, in respects. So, so um, just trying to see if you can keep that gelling process going. And this, and that's the other thing as well, because it's very traditional here to go out for open tenders, um, so that you know anyone can bid for the job. We we try and tone that down, especially because we would like to set ourselves up as being more exclusive and deliver a high quality product. So we we try not just vetting the clients, but actually also vetting the builders. And we're very reluctant to work with builders that we haven't worked with before, um, just because of ultimately what comes out the other end is, is the level of quality that will get us the next, next job as well. So 
yeah, I don't know if that answered your question with respect it, to the builders. Some, yeah, absolutely. And I'm not, yeah, some great, um, so what I heard is that you can use humor and that works with the builders. Yeah. Any other thing that you use when you talk to them that you notice have been successful for having those conversations? Uh, especially uh, if you just show that you have building knowledge, you know, um, because that that probably comes back more to being a woman on a building site. But um, if you just drop a, a few hints of other building sites you've been on or projects you've done or especially mentioning dealing with um, you know, a huge contractor in uh, in Jamaica and you were the one reporting back to your own big, 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 big boss back in Denver, that, that just gives you a bit of credo, I guess, in terms of how to deal with contractors. Mm. So you sort of drop, drop it in the conversation sort of thing. Okay. Because if you and if you came in outright and told them, you know, well, look, I was the blah 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 blah, then they would just take five steps back and not want to talk to you, sort of thing. Okay, so just dropping little hints of competence and then also yes, being very possibly. very disarming. Yeah, yeah. But it, yeah. I mean that works for me, but maybe it's just you know, <laughs> betting the eyelids as a woman. You say you don't use your female charms, but I think you just, I don't know, <laughs> it sounds terrible, doesn't it? But I guess you just do what you can when you're on site to make things work. Because my goal is I don't actually care about being tenches or being a snob or anything of those sorts of things you're normally supposed to be when you're an architect. I understand that to be. So I just, uh, what what's the big goal for me is the end product. I just want to make sure that the end product is um, how you know, it was visualized and that's the biggest thing for me. And once people that are on the building site realize that that's actually what she's all about, then they become much more committed in terms of delivering that result as well. Because there's a lot of, you know, um, in guys' worlds maybe, but the ego and whose ego is the biggest. Um, so I'm, I'm not really interested in that aspect of it. Absolutely. So let's switch over to the conversation with the client. How do you approach that it's, conversation? Yeah, so... Um, uh, how we deal with clients? Well, we tr um, I guess that comes back to initially how we do this, the marketing pitch for us because we, um, when we first started looking at well, how can we grow and how can we get more clients and how can we have so many clients so we can only, so we can pick and choose who we actually want to work with and also put our fees up so we can earn more money, you know, that that's always helps. Um, we decided upon who, um, I, I don't know if you, you call it here, but here you create a marketing avatar of who your ideal client would be. And um, well, I, I might just take, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of steps back. So I was floating around here in my little practice thinking, well, how am I actually going to get more work and more of the work I want to do? Because we've just finished some great projects. Um, and then obviously you hope that that leads on to the next project, but it wasn't happening and it wasn't clicking over into the um, the next couple of great big projects. So I thought, I've got to do something because I don't want to go into a downward spiral and not continue this process. It has to go up instead. Um, and it probably would have, but it would have taken longer. So I I um, just started looking around, seeing what was available and ended up, there was a, um, an outfit, a marketing outfit here in New Zealand who was marketing how you could sell big ticket items and I thought well an architectural service is a, rather a big ticket item and it's also again the stigma of, of working with architects here and I thought that could be an interesting challenge for me to see how we can actually turn that around and, and make that something people would like to have and hanker after so that all of a sudden you're in the driver's seat in terms of setting, setting the time expectations and setting the fee expectations. So I went along to this uh, seminar and um, and I thought, oh, yeah, no, you had a fair few pointers, and then women also go with their gut when they make big decisions. So I felt, oh, no, I think I could work with this guy, and we decided to try it on, and we did it for initially for a three-month period, but it's going really well. And then what he actually um, does once, if you do really well in the first three months in terms of working with this with your marketing approaches, etc., you join up in this um, 100K club, they call it, because the aim is in the next six months to have a, you know, earn $100,000. Um, so, uh, and it sounds crazy when you do it, because architects feel like, oh, we don't earn, we have so many big expenses in, in terms of our fees and keeping up insurance, etc., etc. But it is actually working, so I could see that we could very easily reach those goals, which is great for us. Um, but anyway, so, yeah. That's when we come back to, well, we want to create um, who, who our ideal client would be. And we saw, well, that's someone who's just as passionate about um, heritage and architecture and 
trying to restore and relive old homes as we are and then thought well, well how can we start searching for those and pre vet them so when we actually get to uh, the state of spending time meeting with them they're already interested and already pre-sold to our product so sorry I, I speak quite a lot <laughs> perfect so, that's that's so I, and i'm you listening can say something now you know and then i'll go back to talking like a rabbit <laughs> no worries well on so when these these pre-vetted clients come into you and yes. how does that conversation go do they usually come in with a good idea of the product they want to do or what's that yes. first meeting like? Um, I might just take a step back from the first meeting, and Please. so so we have we try and set up. Our goal is to have ten different lead generators um, at, by the end of this year. We're currently up at six at the moment, and they consist of various um, things. So I'll just um, tell you what it is. So first of all, we have our already pre-fee established working relationship with the franchise renovators. So that's great for us because that gives us work um, and we don't have to do anything to get the work. We just get told when we go to the to the first meeting with the client. So obviously they're already ready to go when we see them. So that's a great uh, earner for us. It may not give us the most exciting jobs all the time, but you also look at how you're going to do your bread and, bread and butter. Then we have our key referrers and um, potential customers, that, uh, which is sort of sitting on what you call a, what we call our circle of love. So they get something sent to them once a month. Normally it's a newsletter. Sometimes it's a voucher for something. Sometimes it's a um, certificate or an incentive to actually refer us to other people. Then we have um, our articles. So we've set up, <laughs> it takes a little bit of greasing back and forth, but we've managed to... Um, have a really great relationship with some journalists now in New Zealand. So you've already seen one of the articles that I uh, forwarded on to you. And at the end of each article, there's actually a call. The whole thing is about having the call to action or offer something for free. So our offer or our call to action for potential clients is well, we'll provide um, this, a little booklet we've written about renovating houses and what's the key considerations and how do you actually hire an architect. Um, because another perception is that architects are always in New Zealand. Architects are always skint. They don't have any money and they don't give anything away for free, you know, because we work so hard for our fees, which we do. Uh, I don't think people understand how hard architects actually work for their fees and how much they actually do. So for them to all of a sudden have this architect who's offering something for free or an architectural practice offering something for free, which is of value of, to them and of interest to them, because they don't want to hear about how cool we think we are. They want, to, they want to get some information that can educate them and help them to make some informed decisions about what they would like to do with their properties. Um, so basically, that's, I don't know, in marketing terms, you call it the monkey's fist. You, you give something little for free and then, and then they'll come back for more and that's when you start billing them. So that's worked really well for us. Um, the other thing we are starting to do now is we do seminars. Uh, as you may know, we have had a rather substantial earthquake in Christchurch, uh, which is on the South Island. Unfortunately, that was um, very traumatic for uh, the whole nation. But what's, what's come out of that is um, there's a lot of uh, the old heritage buildings in crash that's being pulled down. And one of our aims is that we, we, so we join in this campaign to see if we can help save the Christchurch Cathedral, which is of great importance to the city and it's, it's the biggest landmark. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people who want to pull it down. We would like to for it to be restored and maintained. So, so we do these seminars and they... They take a variety of forms. Sometimes we invited guest speakers uh, through some of our builder connections or renovator connections or other people of interest. We're also a member of the Heritage Protect Heritage in our local council area. That's another great way to um, how to just set up um, the seminars and just try to spread the word. Because if you've seen in, in architectural terms or in marketing terms that you have a mission and, and that you have something you want to do for the wider community, people... Um, instantly become very attuned to you and very interested in what you have to say. You know, if you went out and say, I just want to bill you lots of money so I can make a nice living and go on holiday every year, that's not really um, a great sales pitch. You have to have a higher vision and a higher mission in terms of what your practice would like to do and what you would like to do as yourself. And, and the great outcome or the great byproduct of that is that you actually have a lot of fun doing it and you meet a lot of interested and like-minded people as well who are just as interested in, in all those aspects that whoever, whatever that may be, it may not be heritage for other practices, it could be something else. So, so through the seminars, and we always try and have a monkey's fist, so, so often what happens at the seminar, what, what happens at the seminars is a little, 
bag of stuff on each seat with various information. So we have some call to action things, you know, do you want to receive the booklet? We also do a guide of how to actually write a brief for an architect. Lots of people don't know what to do, don't know what to say to architects. Mm. So uh, we've, we've come up with this guide so they can fill it out. Um, and the biggest thing most people also forget is, and that again goes back to trying to attain value to architecture, what is the emotional outcome that you would like to have? in a building, you know, what is what emotions do you want to feel? And that's the conversation that most people don't have, you know, I want to put add a room to my house, or well, why do you want to do it, you know? So so um having do that you, conversation. Do you, do you with, actually ask them that do you say what emotional outcome do you want to have or do you phrase it in a different way when you're talking to them? In our guide we talk about it uh, our pictures as a little story. Um, I've already had this with a client. It was this rough and guts, big bloke. You know, I want to add a room to my house. Why do you want to do it? Oh, because of this. Why, 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 why? So it turned out, in the end, he actually just wanted peace and quiet when he came home from work, but he also wanted to spend more time with his family. So everything goes back to emotion, and everything goes back to interrelationship with the people that live in their properties and live in the residential, house, especially in residential houses. So if you can get them to start talking about the emotional outcomes they would like to get out of the re renovation, all of a sudden it's like a, a, a um, opening a box of, of money really because of course if you're not happy in your home, you know, what wouldn't you give for happiness? It's, it's all of a sudden what you can do for them, it gets a much higher value. So I just see, um, I just try and hold this up to the camera. This is our little pamphlet, that's one of the promotional materials here about how to write the guide. So and it folds out so that you can start, oh, it's a bit tricky, so I just fold it up. So you can start um, filling out that conversation and that, that just gets them thinking about architect and thinking about working with an architect prior to actually seeing us. Um, the other promotional monkey's fist thing we do is, is this booklet here um, and it's got lots of great photos in it but the front is actually saying seven mistakes people make when renovating their house. Um, and I hated the title and I was beaten over the head by my marketing guy saying that this is what you need to say because people don't like making mistakes. So again, you know, you think, oh, you have seven considerations you have to do or something, but it actually has to be a little bit, I don't know if you call it ham-fisted or hard-handed, but to sort of almost shock people into um, starting to think about what it is they want to do. So obviously we focus on, on heritage to just hold another page up, you know, if that's all right from the, um, can you see? You bet, know, you bet. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. it just talks about different things that you, sh you should consider. And again, it's because we're marketing and our USP is about um, character restoration. So all at once you actually make that uh, decision to become a niche expert in something, starting to write educational material you can provide for free to people becomes really easy because all of a sudden, oh yes, I know this is what I want to do. Um, I, I mean, I chose heritage and I chose character homes because that's what's been of great interest to me and because I love buying old places and restoring them and selling them at a profit <laughs> myself. So that's my other sort of business and also I guess it's practice what you preach so people see that you have done that yourself to properties and you made them better and you made them more beautiful and you also made money out of them. Obviously then she must be knowing what what she's up to or what she's doing. So so once we have these, they go out in both in articles, just going back to the lead generators or to the seminars. Um, there was a couple of other ones I can't remember. We've got an ad and there's some sort of swishy magazine down down here about um, beautiful homes. But just a little ad at the back, which is not as expensive as big 10-page spread, how fantastic we are. Just a little, you know, offering a little bit of something for free. It just It's amazing what people, you know, um, they're just really interested in, in that and interested in getting some information from architects because architects don't normally communicate and they don't normally advertise that greatly about themselves or they don't normally provide information for free. So, um, so once that happens and people register their interest, obviously, then we have their contact details and then we go through this sort of process of sending them. First, they get the booklet package and the, and the guide <clears throat> and then after that, we send them sort of a little certificate of that they could get a free consultation with us. Normally architects, oh yeah, of course, I'll come and see you for free. But by actually making it into a, a present or a certificate that attains more value to what you're, you would normally do for free before. And then you put a time limit on it, you know, because you're going to want to make them to actually react and take action. Um, and that gets followed up as well with, uh, we've made some uh, nice postcards with some of our projects on. So again, it just becomes something that is a is a present, but maybe that, and on the back there's 
there's some note comments from referrers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, of how fantastic we are. But it's very subtle because it's someone else seeing it. Not it's not ourselves. Um, but that becomes a postcard, which maybe someone could send to someone else, saying, "Well, look, you know, what do you think of this job?" So what's actually interesting lately, we've received some inquiries from the states. It's New Zealanders living over there, but they want to move back and want to build houses here. So you know, we've got we've got work already lined up for um, the next two years because of this whole process. Um, and what what sort of happens? So so either you register your interest or you don't. So so for a newspaper article like the one I showed we showed you, we had um, 70 inquiries to get this little free booklet. So we start sitting about and start milling them through the process. And then rather than us ringing them up, asking them to have a meeting with us, they have to ring us. So again, then you are in the driver's seat and you you can fit it into your schedule and you can fit it to your price range that you want to charge, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Once that happens, then um, prior to the meetings, we send them another questionnaire about their project and also what money they want to spend and we send them a description of how we operate the process of getting a job. So again, we tell them how we do things. They don't come and tell us how we, they want to do things. So so we get them to work to our schedule and work to how we want to um, run a project because whenever you get people to sign up to that, it, it, it that might sound sort of a bit uh, dictatorship Ish, but people actually feel very confident and they, they get a lot of trust out of that that you've already fought that whole process through and thought about how you want to interact with them and how you're going to provide them with their answers to their problems pretty much. And that's the reason why they come to you. So that, that's working really well. And then the, the last thing we do prior to the actual meeting being signed up is we send them a gift box of who we are. And again, it comes back to that generosity and people think, oh my goodness, you invested $100 in this client. You haven't even seen them yet. But yes, if you end up getting a job for $25,000, don't you think it's worth spending $100? Maybe you don't win them all, but then you've only still only spent $300 or you still only spent $500 and you still get a job for twenty five grand. I'll just see if I can find, I'll just get the box, just, I'll hold, I'll hold it out, it's a bit hard to see on this little DVD, but yeah, so, so, so we have this gift box here that we sent out to um, the clients prior to the meeting, and has, has all the, you know, references, it has previous project sheets, it has, um, like a little um, diary, people can start taking notes down. You know, a couple of gifts, of course, chocolates. Everyone likes chocolates, I do. Um, and just a couple of little things about us. So normally all the things you spend the first 20 minutes of your meeting with, well, have you got any references? Have you got any previous projects? We've already done all that. So when we see them, we just launch straight into talking about their problems and about them because that's really what people are interested in. They want to tell you about themselves and their project. They don't want to have to sit and spend half the meeting trying to get information out of you. You've already provided all that to them. Wonderful. So when they come in for that meeting, they have the understanding of who you are, what you do, and so it's mostly yep. you asking them about their project and what they want to get yep. out of it. So so in the past, we've suffered from, I don't know, if I'm sure it's the same for lots of other actors, you sort of feel like you have to justify what it is you do and you have to justify who you are and you have to try and convince them of what you do is of value. We already have all that. We, we've already done all that. And it's huge to see the different uh, attitude people have to you once you've actually gone through it. You've you spent that time and that money up front sending them stuff. It's still cheaper than you having to drive around in your car get going to see them all the time. So we've had um, where people ring you up and say, well, look, you know, we would, we would like to see you. We've got a gift certificate. This is another thing that happened to me. So I went to see them, and they haven't actually decided to renovate. They just wanted to see if, if I could help them out. So they said, from now on, whenever we look at a house that we might buy to renovate, we we'll just ring you up, and we'll pay you the $140 a visit. So they might be going out to look at 10 houses, and they would like for me to come with them every single time. So it becomes they could see the value of talking to me already um, just prior to even buying their house to renovate. So. Um, that's that's been the huge mental change in in the clients, and it gives us a lot of joy because all of a sudden we don't have to do any of, of justification, I guess is what you say, um, at the meeting. So that makes a great difference, and it makes our job more enjoyable because you can get start talking about what you can actually do with the um, properties we look we see. Excellent, absolutely, Mona. You've really laid out a very complex marketing, uh, just a typical marketing sort of funnel or platform. 
And, yep. you know, and as I was listening, I wanted to interrupt, but I didn't want to want to stall the, the flow of the conversation because I wanted to <laughs> dig into more information. So I have yep. some follow up questions about what you asked right now. Um, yes. But to keep to keep our listeners engaged, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and end this interview right now because we've yep. already we already have a good chunk there. And we'll pick up next week. We're going to dive a little bit in more into the sales process that you go through, how you came up with your marketing plan, how you hooked up with this marketing consultant, and yes. get some more information. How does that sound? Great. That sounds wonderful. Okay, good. Well, thanks for joining us this week, Mona. Great. Thank you. Okay. okay. Well, that puts the lid on another show about the business of architecture. I really hope that you got something out of this show that can help you have more success and profit in the world of architecture. And if you want to join the discussion about this episode, you can find it on the podcast page on businessofarchitecture.com. And while you're there, feel free to share the show using the social media share links. If you sign up for the Business of Architecture Insider List, I'll send you other resources like the Architect Marketing Guide and information on how to use web tools to get more visibility for your firm and your work. expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the hosts, and I make no representation, guarantee, promise, agreement, affirmation, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, commitment, except to help architects conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, do it anyway.